Hello, everyone. Welcome to the SAFS Quantitative Seminar. We will begin at 1230, so in two minutes. Happy Friday, everybody. Thank you for coming to the SAS Quantitative Seminar. And I'd like to thank Chrissy Hernandez for speaking with us today. I'll begin with the land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Chrissy Hernandez. Chrissy received her PhD from the MIT Hui Joint Program in the fall of 2020. Her thesis focused on the distribution, growth, and dispersal of early life stages of marine fishes with implications for management. She also did a side project using data from a laboratory population of rotifers to build matrix models to study the evolution of maternal effect senescence, lower offspring quality with increasing maternal age. In her current position as a postdoc in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University, she's seeking to apply new quantitative methods in ecology to a large number of matrix population models. These meta-analyses seek to identify the life history parameters, species traits, and other factors that most strongly influence population outcomes across a diverse array of plant and animal species. Broadly, Chrissy is is very interested in the roles of early life history processes, maternal effects, and reproductive migrations in driving population dynamics. She has experience with field sampling, laboratory analyses, and several quantitative modeling approaches, and seeks to blend all these skills in a trait-based approach to understanding population dynamics. Her talk today is entitled, Two Stories of Tuna Larvae, Combining Field Observations, Otolith Analyses, and Backtracking Simulations. And since we're in a, a virtual realm today, there, there are two ways to ask questions. One, you can type your question in the question box and um, we can pass it along to Chrissy. The other thing you can do is click the little hand raise button and raise your hand um, and we can unmute you. And Chrissy will be taking questions um, midway through her talk and at the end of her talk. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Chrissy. Thanks. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about some of the work um, that came out of my thesis. Um, before I get into really talking about the projects, um, I need to acknowledge a whole bunch of funding sources that made this work and my PhD more broadly possible, and a whole team of co-authors on the two projects I'm going to talk to you talk about today. The other thing I want to briefly touch on before I get into the science is to um, service to this like two projects I do as service to the scientific community that might be relevant for folks that are listening and that I think you might want to get involved in. Um, the first is the Society for Women in Marine Science or SWIMS. Um, and despite the name, I want to highlight that 
this um, society is open to people with any gender identity. Um, and our goal is really to work for accessibility and equity in science um, for people from a whole host of marginalized identities and intersectional identities. Um, we hope to build networks of support and then leverage those networks to actually um, change practices throughout our, our field. Um, I'm the president of SWIMS. Uh, we also have a Seattle chapter. So if you uh, are interested, you should check that out. We recently became a nonprofit. And so in the process of that, we're working to establish ourselves as a, as a new organization with new, new policies. And we want to do that with fundamentally anti-racist and inclusive practices. So that means we really need to get more voices uh, in the room with us. Um, so we're recruiting new leaders. There are openings for president, vice president, um, secretary and treasurer. We're happy to recruit at any of those levels. Um, and we also are happy to have ongoing conversations in a non-formal um, uh, leadership uh, kind of role. The other one I just wanna briefly mention is the Oceanography Society. So um, I'm the student rep for TOSS and uh, student membership is free. So if there are any students listening and you are not a member of TOSS, you should definitely sign up. Um, and there are two ways you might be interested in getting involved. Um, the first is that I'm always looking for student highlights for our newsletter. Um, I've been sending this about every two months during the pandemic. And um, the student highlights are just 200 to 250 words. And you can talk about anything. And it's just a way for us to connect with each other and look for like how can we see ourselves in others and what um, what is the community of marine science students doing. And we also have a new student committee, which has the goal of increasing engagement with student members um, in, the, in the society at large. So if you're interested in any of those things, please get in touch with me directly or check out the websites of these two organizations. And with that, I will start talking about the science itself. Um, so fisheries are one of the only wild harvest industries that we have still. And the global catch in 2019 was something like 96 million tons. So uh, obviously we need to be carefully safeguarding this resource because we're not generating it ourselves, right? And so the way that we do that is through stock assessment processes where we try to estimate how many adults there are currently, how many offspring they're likely to have, and then run that through the model and think about what that means for a sustainable catch. And some species, for example, tunas, can really complicate these efforts. Um, first of all, because they don't care about international jurisdictions and they live in the high seas largely. And so um, that can make their management a lot more complicated. The other um, complicated thing about tunas is that they start out really, really small and they like most fish larvae, but they have really rapid growth rates. So this larva is 10 to 12 millimeters long. It's already two weeks old, hatched at about three millimeters. And over the next decade, if it survives, it'll grow to be larger than a human. And so we're trying to study this species over these huge scales um, from the size of the individuals that we're trying to study. That spans you know, several orders of magnitude. Um, they're crossing ocean basins on an annual basis. Um, and, and we're talking about needing to study them over decades, right, to really understand the life cycle of, of one of these individuals. So I am really interested in these early life stages and how this rapid growth and high mortality in the early life stages influences the population dynamics. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the, these larvae grow are, they hatch and they're really tiny, right? So they're really vulnerable. And the way that fish kind of balance this is that they produce hundreds to thousands to millions of eggs per individual in a given season. And those eggs hatch out into larvae that experience over 99% mortality before they can get to be one year old. And so when we're talking about these kinds of numbers, these orders of magnitude difference over the course of a year, um, Tiny changes in, for example, starvation could have a really big influence on 
the number of individuals that make it to the juvenile stage. And so um, fishery scientists have understood for a long time that the early life stages can really drive the population dynamics in an important way. So how do I study larvae? Um, I use field methods, not too uh, sophisticated, drag a net through the water and see what you get. Um, I use laboratory methods. So we take those samples back to the lab and we identify which larvae are in the sample through both, both morphological and genetic techniques. And then I really like to work with otoliths. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those on the next slide. And then the last um, kind of category of methods that I use is biophysical modeling. So we take a hydrodynamic model and combine it with biological parameters to understand how larvae get moved around in the ocean currents. So a little bit more about otoliths. Um, it means ear stones, like that's the actual, the root words. Um, these are calcium carbonate structures that are located in the sensory organ, the ears of, of these fishes. Um, so on this tuna, it would be present in this red circle, um, kind of behind the eye and towards the base of the brain. And they have several, um, but um, when we extract these in the laboratory, we'll, and we look at them with transmitted light in a compound microscope, we can see these growth increments or rings. So this has to do with um, cycles in the feeding and metabolism of these fishes. You get different accretion rates and different density of this mineral and protein structure. And in most marine larvae, these, uh, these cycles are actually daily. And so we can resolve the age of the larva in days. Um, and then a little bit more a background on biophysical models. So as I mentioned, these combine a hydrodynamic model, which represents the ocean physics or the ocean currents. Um, and the two that I'll talk about today, or that I'll use today, I won't go into a lot of detail about them, um, are HICOM, which is a global model. Um, so there's coverage anywhere on Earth that you might want to use it, but it's lower resolution. Um, also, you can just download it on the internet, which is kind of nice. Um, and then MABGOM2 is a regional ocean model for the Mid-Atlantic Bight and Gulf of Maine, um, and that was um, that's much higher resolution, and that was developed by Ku Chen and colleagues at HUI in the Physical Oceanography Department. Um, so once you have chosen a hydrodynamic model, you often choose to put particles in it, and these can be biological or not. For example, you might want to model how oil globules move around after an oil spill, and how they break up, and where they end up. Um, or you might be interested in biological particles like eggs or larvae. And you can make those particles entirely passive, or you can give them some behavior. And even abiotic materials might, uh, particles might have behavior like their buoyancy or how the oil globules break apart would change the way they move around. <clears throat> or you might be interested in some active behavior that a biological organism would use. For example, vertical positioning that larvae often do, either on daily cycles like DVM, or just that they have a preferred depth and they will hold that depth even when there are vertical currents that might move them around. So now that I've given you a little bit of background on uh, kind of my approach, um, I'm gonna tell you two stories. In the first one, I'm asking, are tuna spawning in the Phoenix Islands protected area? Um, and this focuses on tropical tunas, skipjack, yellowfin, and big eye. And then in the second portion of the talk, I'll be asking, can Atlantic bluefin tuna larvae spawned in the slope C contribute to population productivity? And this project is um, focused on the recently discovered spawning ground off the US East Coast. Okay, so let's get into this first one. Are tuna spawning in the Phoenix Islands protected area? So the Phoenix Islands protected area is this turquoise polygon. Um, it is part of the Republic of Kiribati. And Kiribati is three island chains, the Line Islands, the Phoenix Islands, and the Gilbert Islands, which together comprise about 33 coral atolls with a total land area comparable to Cape Cod. So really small, right? But they're flung across this huge area of ocean. And these white blobs are showing you the exclusive economic zone of the country. And their exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, is actually the 12th largest in the world. 
Um, so they're really an ocean nation. The other thing that's really important to understand about this country is that they make most of their money from tuna, but not by fishing it themselves. Um, this plot shows you um, across different years, the total fishing license revenue that the country brought in. And so they sell fishing licenses or the right to fish within their EEZ to foreign nations. Um, and this is really important because they don't really have the capital or the infrastructure to support a deep water fishing fleet or um, process, like a lot of processing plants. Um, so they, they bring in money by allowing other countries the right to fish within their waters. Um, and this can comprise up to 70% of their GDP in a given year. Um, there are tons of skipjack tuna. They're really common um, target species for purse stain fisheries. Um, but yellowfin and big eye tuna, which can also be caught in the same fishery um, but, or by long lines, um, those are worth a lot more money. So they're really uh, species of interest. <laughs> Um, so given that I just told you that it can be like 70% of the total income for the entire country comes from fishing licenses, it's really notable that in January 2015, they decided to completely close this huge area, 11% of their EEZ to fishing. And part of the hope was that by closing this really large area, um, there might be some protection for tunas and you might get some spillover so that you could kind of account for the lost fishing area by having increased fishing quality or catch outside of the protected area. And if you're thinking to yourself, protected areas and highly migratory species, like how does that work? I agree. <laughs> so um, the point of this project was to really try to think about whether the closure of PIPA can offer any benefits to tuna populations and tuna fishing in the territorial waters of Kiribati. That's what the protected area managers want to know and, um, and the politicians in Kiribati. Um, that's a really huge question that I can't necessarily answer today, but I can answer some questions in service of that. So I'm asking, what are the abundances and distributions of larval tunas in PIPA? Where were those larvae spawned? And then what can we infer about the adult use of the protected area from our larval data? So um, we did larval sampling with plankton nets. Um, I performed morphological IDs of all the tuna larvae that we collected. We found skipjack and then thunnus species, which includes both yellowfin and big eye. Um, we did do genetic barcoding to confirm that both of those species are present in our samples, but I can't really separate them morphologically. Um, and then I want to estimate spawning sites and output, like I just mentioned. So I use larval otoliths to estimate age at a given size. So we age a subset of the larvae, and then we have a size at age curve that allows us to predict or estimate an age for all of the larvae in our sample. And I use bar particle backtracking simulations to estimate the spawning sites. The other thing I want to mention about this project that makes it really special is that we did it through a partnership with the Sea Education Association. This is a nonprofit based in Woods Hole that um, operates sort of field courses for undergraduates primarily. Um, they have a tall ship in the Atlantic and another in the Pacific. Um, and the students spend about a month in Woods Hole and then one to two months at sea. And they learn, um, they learn how to sail a tall ship. They learn about conservation goals on this trip. They learn a lot about the history and the um, why PIPA exists and why it should exist and why it should be protected. Um, and then finally, they learn how to do really high quality science at sea. There's a real winch, uh, like a, a real CCD. Um, we're doing high quality science off of this tall ship platform, which is really cool. And so I was lucky enough to go on this trip in 2016. And it was really amazing to both experience this ecosystem firsthand and to interact with these undergraduates and get them excited about this work. Over the next few slides, basically all of my results are going to be um, figures that look kind of like this. I'm showing you the bathymetry of the region. It's super deep. We're talking about this is 5,000 meters. And then these seamounts come up really fast. These contours are 1,000 meters apart. 
Um, I'm showing you in all these figures the outline of PIPA. And then in this plot, I'm showing you our cruise tracks. In 2015 and 2016, the cruise left from Honolulu, transited to the protected area, entered through the northeast corner, did this kind of zigzag along the seamounts, and then exited through the south, uh, the, south the southern border. In 2017, uh, there was sparser sampling. They didn't cover the whole cruise track, and um, the stations are further apart. So they are included in the paper, but I'm not going to talk about 2017 very much today. Um, the other good reason to focus on 2015 and 2016 is that we had a really big difference in the ecosystem between those two years. In July of 2015, the ecosystem was in an El Nino state, and in July 2016, it was ENSO neutral. These plots show the satellite imagery of sea surface temperature, and um, the average temperature over the whole protected area is about two degrees warmer in 2015 than in 2016, which might not sound like a lot, but we're really close to the equator. And um, that can actually be like, you know, comparable to their seasonal cycle. So um, that's a really big deal. The other important thing is that this temperature gradient flipped. So it's warmest in the north and then gets cooler towards the south in 2015. While in 2016, we see cooler temperatures in the northeast and then a warming gradient towards the southwest. Uh, these effects, both the, the difference and the flip in the gradient are mirrored in the chlorophyll data. And we also saw um, way more biomass in 2016. So when it was in an ENSO neutral state, we saw much higher chlorophyll and really, really high plankton biomass, like six to eight times as much biomass in the same standard um, net toe that we were doing. So what does this mean for both the distribution of tuna larvae and where we think they came from? So the next few plots, I'm going to show you larval distribution and abundance. Um, again, it shows the bathymetry of the region. The outline of PIPA is now in this bright green. Um, and the cruise track for each year is shown. So this is showing um, collections of skipjack larvae in 2015. The red circles show locations where we sampled and caught zero larvae. The blue symbols are sized based on the abundance of larvae at that site. And then this purple site is an off the charts high abundance site. There was no scaling <laughs> that could get all of um, the full range to be displayed well. So this is really, really high abundance. So the pattern we see is that skipjack abundance is really patchy. We have zero catch locations right next to high catch locations. Um, the highest catch locations are in the Northeast quadrant of PIPA and this really high catch location outside. So that's during our El Nino year. During the ENSO neutral year, we again see quite patchy distribution, the highest catches in the Northeast quadrant, but now this really high catch location has moved inside the protected area. The story for Thunnus species is really similar. Um, it's pretty patchy in 2015, and we see the highest abundances in the Northeast quadrant. In 2016, um, we still have the highest abundances in the Northeast quadrant, but it kind of looks more even across the protected area. We have lower abundance at each location, um, but more positive stations. I'm gonna briefly talk about the larval growth stuff here. Um, we, we have kind of two goals here. We want to know if the big difference in the ecosystem between 2015 and 2016 leads to any observable signal in our subsample. Is larval growth really different between the two years? Um, and the other thing that we want to do is be able to estimate this size at age curve so that it can inform my next step, which is spawning, uh, estimating spawning sites. So these plots show you the number of daily increments observed in the otoliths against the length of each larva. So one dot refers to one larva. And, um, and then these curves are the best fit lines to each of those years. So we have skipjack on the left and thunnus species on the right. And the slope of this line is also a proxy for, or an estimate of the average larval daily growth rate over the observed period. 
So what we find is that there isn't actually a significant difference between the growth rate in 2015 and 2016 for either taxon. And so we'll be using the pooled data going forward. So I want to estimate spawning sites. It's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to go through it slowly. We collect larvae at various sites, and we create those size at age curves that I just showed you on the last slide. Then I do particle backtracking simulations for every larva that we collected, right? We estimate the age of every larva, and I run particle backtracking simulations. I'm using a model called the Connectivity Modeling System, or CMS, um, and that uses some stochastic kicks. And so we get a cloud. I, I run a thousand particles for each larva, and I get a cloud of the most likely spawning locations. Okay. So then I want to combine all these different larvae so that I can give you just one plot of all of the skipjack larvae in 2015. Where did they come from? Which locations had the most spawning? Based on, like, if we backtrack from our observed larval, larval abundance to an, a predicted spawning distribution. In order for me to combine all these different larvae that have different ages, I need to use that high mortality as sort of a filter because the number of eggs we would need to observe one larva of one day old is different than to observe one larva of 10 days old. So I use that to kind of um, estimate or normalize these different uh, particle backtracking simulations. So for each larva, I have this cloud of probable locations um, scaled by how many eggs would have been needed. And eventually I combine them all and I scale it so that the maximum value in this plot is one and we're calling it relative spawning output. Um, yeah, I use CMS. Okay, so this is kind of like a, like a heat map or a probability map. The colors are telling you the probability of strong connections of spawning activity in that area contributing to the observed larval distribution that we sampled. Okay, on these plots, again, you see the bathymetry, again, you see the um, outline of PIPA. And now I'm also adding the, um, average currents from HICOM for the cruise period. So in 2015, our El Nino year, we can basically say that the skipjack larvae collected inside of PIPA were spawned inside of PIPA, and that those collected outside were spawned outside. We had that really high catch location outside, um, leading to this high dark red um, area of probable spawning. In 2016, in the neutral state, um, the currents are a bit stronger, and we see that these, um, these, these clouds of probable spawning locations are smeared out along the currents, and we see a lot more movement of larvae across the boundaries of the protected area. And you might remember that the high catch location was outside of PIPA in 2015, and in 2016 it was inside. But we still think that the highest locations of strong spawning are outside of the protected area just to the northeast. The story for Thonis is basically the same. In 2015, we see a lot less movement of larvae across the boundaries. And in 2016, there's a lot more of that movement across the boundaries because of stronger currents. So in conclusion, um, tunas are spawning inside PIPA. Absolutely. The larval distribution and growth was similar in 2015 and 2016, despite dif big differences in the ecosystem due to ENSO. And these numerical simulations that I showed you, they help us understand where the actual spawning activity by adults is occurring relative to the protected area, right? So we're, it's kind of a nice way to sample in this area because we're extracting larvae that have really high mortality rates and the prop, like, our chances of affecting the population in a meaningful way are quite small, but we're getting a lot of data about where we think the adults might have been. Um, and so I think I will pause now to take some questions about this project.
Um, um, Chrissy, I have a quick question while people are um, typing into the chat or raising their hand. Um, is So you were only collecting larvae primarily inside Pippa with some exception of collections to the northeast of Pippa, right? I, I guess I'm, yeah. I'm wondering from sort of a devil's advocate viewpoint of these MPAs and what the policy implications of this could be if, um, you know, it's possible that the highest, some of the highest spawning areas were actually outside of Pippa, but that, um, you know, those, those larvae uh, were outside of your sampling area. And then in that case that like, um, you know, there, there may be higher catch rates because of the protected area and those regions outside of the protected area as sort of a unintended consequence of PIPA. Yeah, um, so my cop-out answer is that I would love to see lots of larval sampling all across the Pacific. Um, yeah. We haven't had a comprehensive sampling for uh, plankton or tuna larvae um, since about the 50s and the, like the 70s was the most recent like large scale sampling. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important point. Like I can't say anything about what, how many larvae we would catch outside or um, yeah, it seems like even the ones we're catching inside might be coming from outside. So what if we sampled further downstream of Pippa? Like what would we find there? So yeah, I think those are, uh, I would love to, I would love to have more data. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that's a cop out at all. That. I think that's exactly what, what is needed to either refute or validate that. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, Kristen asks, what kind of data was used or criteria evaluated when PIPA was established? Yeah, so a lot of the impetus for establishing PIPA was actually about protecting um, endemic species of crab um, the and fishes. Um, they have really pristine reefs. Uh, it's migratory habitat for turtles and birds and et cetera. Um, there's lots of sharks on the reefs. Um, it's really healthy ecosystem. And so there was, um, yeah, people got excited about protecting this really pristine, really remote ecosystem. Uh, it's probably worth noting that there haven't been really any permanent settlements in the Phoenix Islands that we have evidence of. So um, the, it's really far from any other inhabited islands. And currently there are maybe 30 people living there that work for the government and manage the protected area. Um, so that was a lot of the justification, but I think some of the stuff I mentioned about highly migratory species and like this hope for spillover, I think some of that like came out of trying to justify this huge closure to the government. And so there's a little bit of like spin and then trying to figure out what is appropriate um, to talk about scientifically. I hope that answers your question. Um, So Andre says, uh, I sort of missed it, but you, did you do a quantitative metric of probability that a spawning location led to the observed data? Um, no, it's kind of a, so the, the model, I'm using a thousand particles per uh, larva, which is based on what um, Claire Paris, who developed CMS, that's how she does backtracking. Um, and then that gives us this cloud for each larva. And so it's kind of, I'm just trying to come up with a reasonable way to combine all the data, but I don't have like a statistical method for assessing how likely it is that it contributed. Um, and yes, they do. You, the second question is, um, those are great models, but don't they assume predation is independent of space? Yes, this is my big thing. So like if anybody wants to work on thinking about spatially variable mortality for larvae um, and how we can implement that in a reasonable way into larval dispersal models, I would love to talk more about that. I'm, that is like one of my pet peeves. Um, 
about that. So uh, yeah, um, I think I need to continue and then um, we can come back to some more of these questions at the end, if that's okay. All right. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about Atlantic bluefin tuna larvae, which I love. Um, so I'm asking whether Atlantic bluefin tuna larvae spawned in the slope C contribute to the population productivity. Over the past hundred years or so, uh, we've generally assumed that Atlantic bluefin tuna biology works like this. Individuals are spawned in either the Mediterranean Sea or the Gulf of Mexico. And those individuals exhibit such strong natal homing that they will only go back to those two, like their natal location um, to spawn. And that therefore, you can draw this arbitrary line across the middle of the Atlantic. Anything you catch on the Eastern side of that is an Eastern fish that was born in the Med. And anything you catch on the Western side is a Western fish that was caught, that was spawned in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we know that it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that is generally how our stock assessments work. The other quirk of our model of um, bluefin tuna biology is that individuals mature as young as three or four years old in the Mediterranean Sea, but no individuals under the age of nine are observed in the Gulf of Mexico, which suggests that either spawning is occurring somewhere else in the Western Atlantic or there are some other reasons that maturity is really, really different between these two um, closely, closely related and probably mixing stocks. Um, so for a long time, there's been uh, questions about whether Western Atlantic bluefin tuna are spawning someplace else. And um, one place that they might be spawning is this region called the Slope Sea. So this area is bounded, it starts around here at um, Cape Hatteras where the Gulf Stream starts to pull away from the coast. It's bounded by the shelf break on the inshore side and the Gulf Stream on the offshore side. And we mostly focus in this, in our work on um, this section out to about George's Bank, but technically the term Slope C covers more area out into the um, Central Atlantic. So this area became really notable and of interest to Atlantic bluefin tuna biologists when in 2013, um, Dave Richardson and colleagues um, collected bluefin tuna larvae uh, throughout a pretty broad area um, here off the US East Coast. And potentially, if there is spawning outside of the Gulf of Mexico, it could have a really big impact on the population dynamics. Um, so as I mentioned before, we know that fish don't enter the Gulf of Mexico before about nine years old, but in the Mediterranean, they mature at about four. And there's growing evidence from the Western Atlantic that there isn't actually a maturity difference. So in, in sampling in the Gulf of Maine, there was evidence of recent or nearby spawning only in the fish that were 18 to 14 years old. So the fish on the younger side of what was able to be sampled in that study um, probably spawned somewhere closer to the Gulf of Maine than the Gulf of Mexico. And in another study using a hormone, hormone proxy measurement, um, they found no difference in maturity between the fish that were over nine years old and those that were five to nine years old. So potentially, the age of maturity isn't actually that different between the two stocks, the Eastern and Western stocks, but Gulf of Mexico spawners only can make up this, these red bars, and all these green bars are fish that are likely to be mature based on this hormone proxy evidence, but that don't spawn in the Gulf of Mexico. And so if those fish are spawning in the slope C, this potentially is, you know, like, huge for our understanding of the biology of this stock and then has implications for how we do our stock assessment models um, and then has implications for how we manage this stock. So this is a big deal to understand what the true maturity of these fish is and um, what's happening with the larvae that we've collected in this other location. So the big question is whether the larvae that are spawned in the slope C can actually contribute to population productivity. Um, 
And the sub questions that I can attack one by one are, how does the distribution of larvae compare between the slope C and the other spawning grounds? Is the number of larvae in each of these locations, you know, like, is it important? Is it an important number of larvae? Second, how does the larval growth rate in the slope C compare to that in the Gulf of Mexico? So some have argued that the slope C is probably really poor habitat and therefore um, those larvae aren't gonna be important. They can't contribute to the juvenile population because they're not gonna survive their larval period. So larval growth rates give us a way to kind of get at that question. And then finally, what are the transport conditions for larvae collected in the slope C? Are the larvae that we collected in the slope C truly spawned within that area? Or are they coming from south of Cape Hatteras and being transported in by the Gulf Stream? And will those larvae remain close enough to the coast where the nursery habitat is to be able to actually join the juvenile population? Or do they get just kind of like washed out in, this, in the Gulf Stream? So we used opportunistic sampling during the summer of 2016 with standard NOAA plankton methods to collect uh, plankton samples and bluefin tuna larvae. And then a lot of the work I'm gonna show you is focused on otoliths. I dissected larvae from the slope C and photographed their otoliths myself. I also received otolith photographs from the Gulf of Mexico, which were collected in the same year, but in the spring, because because of temperatures, there's an offset in the seasons um, of spawning, of larval presence. Um, and this is really important because reading otoliths is a little bit subjective, right? You have a human brain trying to, uh, um, detect patterns in an image of this uh, <laughs> mineral structure and you're placing little dots to, to mark each of the increments. And so small differences in how I read an otolith versus how someone else reads an otolith um, can really be a barrier to being able to directly compare two data sets. Um, so having me as a single reader do the reads for both regions means I can directly compare growth rates between those two areas. And that hasn't really been done before for bluefin tuna. And finally, um, I, this larval transport question. So we use backtracking modeling to estimate spawning locations, similar though simpler than what I showed you before. And then we use forward in time modeling to investigate retention. Okay, larval distributions. So we caught larvae across a pretty wide area in the slope C. We have kind of a cluster of positive stations up here near um, south of George's Bank and over here um, to the northeast of Cape Hatteras. And I'm not going to go into a ton of details, but I looked at this data through um, a couple different angles and tried to compare it with what we see in the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea to ask, are these larval distributions that we would that are consistent with um, categorizing this area as a spawning ground? And they are. Uh, and I'm happy to talk more about those details later. Um, but what I really want to focus on is the larval growth work. Um, so first I'm showing you size at age, which is um, similar to what I showed you before. Daily increments are on the x-axis, and the standard length of the larvae is on the y-axis. Each dot represents one larva. Um, the black lines are fit to the data in this panel, and the gray lines are the fits from this panel. And likewise, the Gulf of Mexico has the slope C lines plotted in gray. So you might notice that there's more data from the Gulf of Mexico, and that is telling you that systematic sampling is really great, <laughs> and we need more data. Um, but uh, at least working with what we have. Um, we want to ask whether the larval growth rate is similar in these two locations. And the slope of this line is a proxy or an estimate of the average daily growth rate of the larvae. So we find no significant difference in the slopes of these two lines, meaning that the daily growth rates are quite similar between the two regions. But we do find a significant difference in the intercepts. So larvae from the slope C are actually slightly larger at the beginning of larval life than larvae from the Gulf of Mexico. So in the previous panels, we only had one data point per larva, 
but actually we can get at much more detailed information from these otoliths by digging into the increment widths and the radii. So the increment widths are literally just the widths of each daily increment, and that can give you a proxy for the daily growth rate on each day of larval life. So you can say, you know, on the first day, they grow this well. On the second day of their larval life, they tend to grow this well. Um, so that's what I'm showing you in the left panel. So increments again are on the x-axis and this mean increment width is on the y-axis. So we can directly compare the slope C in the Gulf of Mexico um, daily growth rates. And what we see again, similar to the slopes being the same in the past slide, um, these daily growth rates overlap. And our slope C data does get kind of messy. Again, I would love to have more otoliths, um, but overall we can, we can see that these daily growth rates overlap. On the right panel, I'm showing you the mean radius. So this is the distance from the middle of each otolith to each successive increment. And this gives us a proxy for past larval length. And what you might notice is that the slope C dots are slightly higher than the Gulf of Mexico dots, and they have sort of a consistent offset over these first few days of life. So we ran a Welch t-test to ask if this difference was statistically significant. And it is. So similar to saying in the previous slide that the intercept of the two lines was significantly different, here we're seeing that the distance to the first increment is significantly different between the two regions. So by two different ways of looking at this otolith data, we're seeing that fish from the Slope Sea and fish from the Gulf of Mexico grow at similar rates at the beginning of larval life, but that on the first day of larval life, slope sea fish are slightly larger. And this could be accommodated by the, or accounted for in the difference in temperatures between the slope sea and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but it could also have something to do with the migration distance that the parents undergo and sort of maternal, maternal provisioning kind of argument. Okay, so backtracking simulations. Um, here I'm showing you in black the collection sites and in the blue triangles, the backtracked origins. Um, in this case, because we used a high resolution model, we have a single best estimate for spawning location uh, for each larva. And what, uh, oh, and this orange polygon is our definition of the slope C boundaries. So what you see is that basically all of the or the vast majority of these blue triangles are within the slope C boundaries, with the exception of about five trajectories um, that uh, originate near this kind of, um, this, this pattern to how these collection sites are arranged is actually a Gulf Stream meander that we sampled along the edge of. Uh, and those fish are more likely to have originated from south of Cape Hatteras. Um, but I want to note that all of these other ones actually account for about 70, 97% of the collected larvae, um, because each triangle is a unique combination of collection location and larval age. Um, so the vast majority of these larvae were in fact spawned in the Slope Sea, and they cluster actually along the shelf break which was not necessarily what we expected. Um, and then we did some forward in time simulations. So juvenile habitat is up here on the shelf somewhere. We don't really know exactly where, but we can assume that if larvae were swept really far out in the Gulf Stream, or if they crossed the Gulf Stream and they were in the Sargasso Sea, that they wouldn't be able to swim back across and get to the shelf. So we're asking where were these larvae, where would these larvae have ended up if we had not collected them? Where would they have been on day 25 of larval life when they start to be quite good at swimming and particle tracking isn't a good approximation of their movement anymore? And again, we see that most of these trajectories remained in the slope C, except for these same few that were collected along the Gulf Stream front. So to conclude this section, Larval abundance in the slope sea is consistent with characterizing the area as a spawning ground. We saw no difference in larval growth rates between the Gulf of Mexico and the slope sea in 2016. But we did see that slope sea larvae were slightly larger at increment one. 
and larval transport simulations indicate that spawning sites and retention are within the slope C boundaries. What that means is that we cannot ignore the slope C and we really need to study it more. So throughout this talk, I've shown you a bunch of data about tuna, which um, are charismatic and valuable and uh, ecologically important animals. Um, and I've mostly focused on larval stuff because by extracting the larvae from the environment, we are having much less of an impact on those adults because of the high mortality rates during the larval phase. So it allows us to get information about the adults by only sampling the larvae. And I do that by combining otolith data and modeling approaches. And what I hope that I've been able to convince you is that by combining all of these different techniques, we take fairly sparse data and get a lot more out of it than we would if we just plotted the distributions. So to summarize, um, I've presented evidence and patterns of tuna spawning in Pippa, where both skipjack and thunnus species larvae were observed in all years under both El Nino and neutral conditions. And I've provided support for the slope C as a major spawning ground for Atlantic bluefin tuna, with evidence from larval abundance, growth rates, and backtracking simulations. And as I said, I hope what I've kind of convinced you is that by combining field data, laboratory analyses, and biophysical models, we maximize what we can learn about marine resources. And with that, I will take some more questions. Thanks for listening. Excellent. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for an excellent, for a really fascinating talk. And for the audience, please feel free to um, type questions or raise your hand. And there are a few already in there, um, but up to you, Chrissy, if you'd like to go back. Um, to answer part one questions or to continue on the second part. Um, yeah, I'm happy to try to answer some of the, um, I'll answer maybe some of the newer ones as they come in and then see how we do on time. Um, so uh, Matt asks, any genetic parentage work done on these larvae versus med and GOM spawners? Yeah, so there is some preliminary work coming out of that. Um, I don't really know the results. Um, I do know that some of our slope sea larvae were sent to a collaborator in Spain as part of a population genetics project. Um, and I think there's been a little bit of preliminary data showing that they might, it might be a site of mixing, um, that the slope sea might actually, the larvae collected in the slope sea might have more sort of intermediate uh, identity. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, thinking about skip spawning of, of Mediterranean transients. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of questions, right? That we have tagging data that suggests that individuals don't go to the Gulf of Mexico every year, even after they're big enough to do that. There's, I, there's a lot, there's a lot of interesting questions about like who is actually hanging out in the slope sea, um, and and how many of them are there, and and what sizes are they? I think those are really important questions to nail down if we're going to modify our our population models. Um, Andrew asks, what kinds of larval behavior would these tuna exhibit? DVM orienting to currents. So. In basically all of the sampling of like depth stratified sampling of larval tunas suggests that they don't do DVM. Um, and if they do, they, you know, they shift like a few meters up and down, but they're basically always in the top 50 meters in some locations, 25 meters in some locations. Um, bluefin tuna larvae, we actually assume they're in about the top 10. Um, so depending on the species and the ecosystem they're in, they want to be in quite warm and um, well-lit waters. So one of the cool things about tuna larvae is that they have these really, really big eyes and quite a big mouth, and they, um, they become piscivores relatively early. 
And so they want to be up where they can see the other larvae really well and they're, they're hunting other fish larvae. Um, and in terms of orienting to currents, oh yeah, go for it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there was a, a, a hand raised, but it looks like the hand went down. So sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's fine. Um, the hand went back up. Yeah, it's, it's Alicia. Great. So yeah, I will, I will unmute you. Um. Hi. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Alicia. Uh, Christina, very good talk. Um, I am proposing to do similar work in Alaska. So I would love to talk to you about larval drift and all kinds of stuff. Um, but were you surprised uh, when you saw that there were no differences in growth between in both cases? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I definitely was surprised that there was no difference in growth in Pippa because of that um, big and really widespread difference in both temperature and food availability. I mean, in, there could be some kind of compensation, like it was colder, but there was a lot more food um, in the Pippa example. In the Slope C example, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a little bit of like, uh, you, you're looking for the answer you want, but um, but I I was hoping, and what I thought based on some other work folks have done on showing that the basically spawning doesn't occur in the slope C until it gets to the same kinds of temperatures as you have in the Gulf of Mexico, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I actually would expect pretty similar growth between the two regions. Um, if, if it's like a normal year and the tuna are targeting the same kinds of things in both locations, um, the same kinds of habitat needs for their larvae. So yeah. <laughs> um, and I would love to talk to you more about your work. So please definitely email me and we can chat about larval drift. I definitely will, thanks. Great. Um, so there's one or two questions in the chat about um, the PIPA project. So I, I'll go back to those. Um, uh, Maite asks, how fast can the larvae move from inside to outside the MPA through the currents? Yeah, so in a lot of those cases, those larvae are only, I most of my larvae in that study are a week or younger. So they can move pretty fast. Um, the, the currents are sufficiently fast to move them across those boundaries within about a week. Um, and I'm very sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, but Yiduan uh, asks, did you try to include temperature in the growth model? Um, no, I didn't directly include temperature as a covariate. Um, we do use temperature in our mortality function um, for that, for the PIPA study, um, but I didn't try to incorporate it directly into the growth model. Um, I don't have a good excuse for why. Maybe because uh, if, if temperature is really, I mean, if growth is really responsive to temperature and we only have the, we only know the temperature where we collected them, then maybe that's not good enough, but um, it's definitely worth, it would definitely would have been worth trying. Um, so yeah, those are all the questions I see typed in. I don't, I don't know, um, Megan, if yeah, I don't, I don't see hands raised. Um, so thank you for a great presentation. And um, uh, thanks everyone for, for, for listening to the talk. And hopefully we will see some of you back here next week. Have a good day. Thanks so much.